let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. I am Chris Spangle, and this is a special series called The Swamp Explained. And I am joined by Rob Cortell, a 45-year fly on the wall in Washington, D.C. Rob has worked for Republican presidential campaigns, government agencies like the EPA, and has been confirmed by the Senate to the U.S. Federal Maritime Commission. And he's also been a candidate for Congress and Senate. He's also spent years working in the private technology sector, working with startup companies, and given his experience and iconoclastic viewpoints, Rob gives us a great insight into the swamp that makes up our nation's capital. It is so great to see you, Rob. Uh, yeah. We have, uh, I think I will begin with WTF. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I'll begin with Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. Yes. Uh, yes. It, uh, but, you know, this is, a, well, we're talking about a lot of things going on, obviously. The uh, insurrection, uh, the the uh impeachment the this the that the uh, it's totally amazing and i'm sitting here realizing i'm smiling thinking about it all even though it's totally appalling <laughs> <laughs> i haven't been smiling at all it's hit me emotionally pretty hard i mean it's been sort of uh just a crazy crazy week thinking that there may be more violence ahead that's the part that's i think yeah. the heaviest yeah uh, i i agree in terms of I mean, as an actual fact, um, but you know, um, I, I think, well, you can explain it with all sorts of theories. I'm sure Trump will be explaining what they, you know, it was the bad boys. And now, of course, uh, QAnon is saying it's uh, Antifa and so right. on and so forth. It's not really Trump supporters. They would never do this. And, um, you know, it's, it is at its core, it's probably more an example of a mob run wild, but, um, but it is shocking nonetheless. And, uh, uh, and, you know, there will be a lot of heads to roll on this, including the Capitol Police, um, who, by all accounts, probably knew this was going to, some version of this would happen for months and months. Uh, you know, it's a 2,000 man and woman force. And I, I was talking to my wife about it yesterday, and she was saying, you know, I just have a hard time envisioning any of those people uh, pulling a gun or defending anyone, you know, you, you see them at the entrance to all the buildings and they're just sort of, they don't strike me as, uh, you know, police-like. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. yeah. So I read an article last night about all this and the Washington post did a really deep dive into what happened before. Right. And the Capitol police kind of said, oh, the, the head, I think her name is Sund. She said uh, he or she, I apologize. It was but a he. It, he basically, oh, yeah, it's all under control. It's all under control. And everybody was just because on the Capitol, it's the Capitol police have the jurisdiction there right. and nobody can come on their property without being invited on. And it wasn't until the Capitol was breached that the sergeant at arms finally went and, and invited the National Guard and agencies, but it, it took hours for them to all scramble. You know, in the Capitol Police, obviously you had one injury and that particular officer- had one death. Nick, was knocked unconscious with a fire extinguisher. And then he the died. crowd- Yeah, the crowd continued to hit him. They're holding American flags. Like they're beating him while he's on the ground dead. And then, you know, you had the officer who- um, the the senate i mean this video of it is i mean this guy is heroic basically well These there was uh well the, you know the backdrop some of the backdrop to this is that they they were planning for a big crowd and um yeah. and uh, muriel bowser who's the mayor of dc and who is you know she's pretty savvy um she had decided and she said this in public that they were said it in advance that the the dc police would not be carrying weapons and they should ask for 200 national guard and that they not carry weapons. Um, they were very cognizant of the optics of having the weapons on the Black Lives Matter and other protests and, and how some of that potentially went awry. So they really didn't want DC to look like an armed city. And hmm. then, um, uh, and then uh, of course, once all this started um, and the crowd got out of control, it wasn't random that it got out of control as we well know, you have Trump and uh, I've forgotten the Congressman's name from I think he's from Texas, and then uh, Cruz, yep, right, and Holly Giuliani. Well, Cruz and Holly weren't at that rally at the White House, 
to my knowledge. Oh, uh, oh okay, I got you. Yeah, it was these other guys, and they were, you know, remember that Giuliani was cheering them on with um, sort of mano a mano. You know, we should um, uh, have a, you know, hand to hand face off and. Uh, and Trump was, I'm going to be right there with you walking down kind of thing. We had, uh, we played audio of Don Jr.'s speech. I mean, oh, we're yeah, going to fight. Tough. We're going to be in your backyard. We need to right. fight the left fights. I mean, right. well, I, I think what people need to understand is the psychology of the people that were there. And we talked in the last episode of the Chris Bangle show about, we talked to two people who were there who were just f- flat out shocked by what happened and were horrified and, um, didn't expect it. And they said, you know, most people were there for the fun atmosphere of the rally, but then there was this violent element that's in tactical gear. The militia guys, they're the ones to worry about. They're the The one guy in the the horns and headdress. Yeah. Right. And, (laughs) and, you know, you hear that. And when you talk to these MAGA folks, especially the hardcore people, it's the demonization of the left. The left has become a super villain that you know, they're part Thanos, part Borg. They're going to, t- they've already taken over. Mm-hmm. They're about to take over the police and the military too. They're going to get you. They're going to get you. They're going to get right. you. And then you've got Don Jr. standing there going, we need to fight like the left does. Let's fight, fight, fight. Now march down there. Right. You know? Well, it, and, and so it's, it's not surprising, problem. but you know, that many people, but you really, but some 65 or 70% of Republicans still believe the, the election was stolen. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, I'm, I'm minded of Goebbels, you know, who used to say before the Reich that um, one of his mottos was, if you repeat something often enough, it becomes a truth. Yeah. And, and that's really what's been going on. And, and, you know, 120 some Republican congressmen went down there and supported that argument. Uh, uh, many like my own down here would said that, uh, oh, it was just to give people a voice. Well, they had a plenty of voice and they had it on November uh, in the November election. And, um, and of course, the courts have denied all of the, the uh, uh, suits and, and um, that was I, I, their voice. And, let, and let, they let's wanted deal to with deny that. the voice to 20 million others. Right, the right. Ne- the, yeah, the never silent majority that never stops telling us what they think that has their own yeah. information <laughs> ecosystem that has their own social networks. Like their voice has not been silenced. They just lost. And now yeah. they're trying to silence, like you said, 20 million other people. Like what? Yeah. You're well, not fighting like um, never you're fighting die. for a hurt feelings of a president. Yeah. Well, I thought actually, I thought I thought uh, Romney and uh, and Ben Sass and uh, and for once uh, Mitch McConnell actually acquitted themselves really well. Mitch was a little late to that party, I would say, um, and and of course his wife Elaine Chow resigned, uh, also a little late to the party. Um, uh, so and and Betsy DeVos also late to the party. Um, and, um, uh, and the whole thing is, you know, this is still unfolding. You know, it's, it's, uh, I think we can all figure out how it started and, and everybody has a point of view as to whether, uh, Trump was, uh, deliberately inciting, um, uh, uh, insurrection at the Capitol and the takeover. And there'll be arguments about that. And, you know, I think, I, I think part of him just doesn't get the power of the word, never got the power of the language of the president. And, um, and of course, now we have the, the Democrats uh, going after impeachment and, and uh, people like Lisa Mur- uh, Murkowski saying, uh, uh, let's, you should resign and others telling Pence he should call uh, the 25th Amendment in the cabinet and, and certify that he's a lunatic. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you have these arguments going on about he should, he should do that so that he, he uh, can be uh, pardoned by Pence. I mean, this is, this is just going wild. It's not over. And I feel in some ways, sorry for Biden because Biden, I think it genuinely would like to reboot and he wants some focus on the agenda going ahead. And I know he's conflicted. And of course, if the democratic party has its way, he's going to be overwhelmed by all the Trump stuff through an impeachment. Whether he should be impeached or not, that's, you know, these are the things that people have stopped acting like adults. So, I, uh, I, I, I'll I push back on the, he doesn't understand the power of the presidency. I think the, you know, January 20th. The language. The language, right. He's yeah. in Iowa. 
and he's giving a speech and this is the famous the infamous line i can go out on fifth avenue shoot somebody it's it's yeah. really incredible i think he understood his power very early on and i think a lot of us kind of because we're normal people want to give him the benefit of the doubt and want to give all these people the benefit of the doubt and that has kind of allowed him to go really unchecked and it's it's like when you see somebody who has if you've ever held had a person like every person that i know that was in a, a, a relationship with a narcissistic person from the beginning has hated this guy because they just trip those wires and mm -hmm. i've i've been thinking a lot about that lately because he reminds me now I gave him the benefit of the doubt, but he reminds me now of one of those people. And that pattern of breaking up with that person almost 80% of the time ends up in violence. And I think if he's not checked in this moment, if he's not reined in, he's not put in jail, he's not going to stop. And well, I'm, okay, I, I get that. And by the way, I, I don't think he misunderestimates his, his um, pow power. But I think he still, in many ways, thinks of this as a reality show, yeah. and 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 so it's a fantasy in so many different ways. I mean, he lives in a fantasy land uh, in a lot of different ways, and 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 in some ways that's probably to his benefit because he he can barge ahead and do stuff that other people could only fantasize about, um, whether you agree or disagree with him on a policy or this or you know get rid of the shower the shower regulations and the toilet regs and. And everybody was saying, give me a break. Is that what you really want to focus on? But in his fantasy, these are important things. And, and, um, but the, uh, I think the, I, I just think he is living in uh, a fantasy land. But, but I'll tell you what, the problem, you know, this is the dilemma in a democracy. And I think this is one of the biggest, for me, the biggest issues are the, the speech issues. I, you know, you and I have talked before about the antitrust act actions on Google and Yahoo and on uh, Amazon and all that. And I, I for one, uh, Facebook, don't support um, antitrust on the platforms, but I, I absolutely support it on Amazon, which mm. has become uh, hor horizontally and vertically uh, integrated across the economy. And they're like an octopus and I think we talked about some of those issues. So now we have the situation, the reaction to Trump and all the issues you talked about, in my opinion, is actually in some ways more damaging to the long-term democracy. So Absolutely. Facebook, which is essentially a utility for many people, has cut them off. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Twitter, which is a utility to millions of hundred uh, billions of people, he's, they've cut them off. Um, uh, uh, Instagram has cut them off. Um, Amazon has cut off, um, uh, you know, Harler. Harler and all the rest of these guys won't let them use the platform. Well, if some of those companies did it in any other part of the world, the governments would be outraged. We would be outraged. We would decry the fact that they're censoring people, even if their views are unpopular or right. they're censoring them because their views are antithetical to that particular government, which, of course, they all think they're legitimate. And so to me, my, my big concern is the reaction um, to this. I, I hate to say it, he should not be cut off. Um, I hate to say it, these platforms should not be censoring anyone. Um, I just think that is a slippery slope. And oh, by the way, now that they've started to do it, I'm all in favor of regulating the hell out of them. Because so if they're gonna be censors and if they're gonna cut people off, because they don't like their views. Well, well, it's inciting a riot. Not all of his views are inciting a riot, um, even though most of them are. But he he has a right to live in La La Land, and, uh, and that's I, a problem. I don't know about the regulation, but I will completely, wholly agree with you. And this is my argument with Alex Jones. Once you once you go into regulating political speech, you are going to own that, and it's going yep. to end up destroying their business. And it's yep. and it's well on its way, which I'm not going to be sad if the social media companies die, even though I make my living on it. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, re, the psychology of the left is coming for you is so deeply ingrained in the MAGA movement. Mm -hmm. And the argument that you are going to stop terrorist uh, events from being planned on your platform totally 
totally understand that you wouldn't want somebody planning insurrection in your home, but they haven't been doing that for 10 years. Those people have been on signal and other encrypted devices yeah, for a totally. long time. Just They're, like they, they are in they, other the, the countries. Part, right. The, the view after Wednesday was establishment Republicans here locally that were committed to Trump going, maybe I was wrong about this guy. But then the second they banned him, all those people went right back home and said, you know what, maybe they're right. They're coming for me. I'm next. Yeah. They're going to memory hole me or well, or well, like it, it, they, these companies thought that they were trying to stop something. And what they did is the, the Reichstag fire moment didn't work because Trump is incompetent on Wednesday. And then they went ahead and gave them their own Reichstag moment with the banning yeah. and, and parlor. Like you're totally. saying to people who are, you should lock up insurrectionists, but the people that were just standing around waving Trump flags weren't the insurrectionists. And those people now are more likely to become insurrectionists because yeah. they have bought into the propaganda of Donald Trump. Or check out. And right. I don't think it's good they check out. Now, you know, there's so many different waves of and, and of uh, issues here. I mean, I think these people these people, by the way, these people who voted for Trump are half of the population of voters. So they're, yes, they're seven or eight million fewer than Biden. But when you get down to the numbers, it's almost every other person you meet voted for Trump. Every other person voted for Biden. So I think one of the big issues for society and primarily now Biden is, and the Democratic Party is to figure these people out. Why is it, why is it that some very large percentage voted twice for Obama and then twice for Trump. There, there, there is a message in that about people's views of who they are and how the government treats them. And uh, I think that's, I think that's going to be the real big political question of the next, you know, a decade or more. And, and Biden doesn't have a lot of space to play in that. And in some ways, he's the perfect guy. I, I, I find him I must say he looks decrepit and he sounds he's, decrepit. He's decrepit, ineffectual, yeah. weak. But uh, I, mean, I don't think of... he's I don't think he's weak. I think he knows his mind. I, I'm I mean the you know, the big argument from so many of the Republicans I know is well, he's okay, but you know, Kamala Harris is really gonna, you know, run him like a puppet. I really don't believe that. Um, unless something happens to him and I doubt she's gonna make it happen to him. Uh uh, this, so, this guy's run for office four times. His whole life has yeah. been about becoming president. Like in yeah. many ways, he knows and we should he talk about. He knows he, he's waited for this moment his entire life, and much like Mike Pence, who his entire ambition, which is greater than any other value he holds, has been to become president of the United States. And when Trump turned on him this week, now all of a sudden, go to Twitter and type in, um, "quote." The, a source close to the vice president says, end quote, yeah. and look at all the different stories that are starting to leak out of Mike yeah. Pence's office. Yeah, uh, he The long knives are out between those two, which is going to be fascinating. I mean, what do you make of, what do you make of Mike Pence and, and his actions over the past week? Well, you know, Pence is a creature of the establishment. I mean, he was, he, he, he he's bland and everything else and Third in the utterly amb amb Governor, amb yeah. ambition ribbon, ribbon as you describe him i agree with you 100 um, percent. but he is absolutely a creature of the establishment he is right of center he's way too conservative for me personally and a lot of other people uh, but he's got to straddle yeah. that line and i think he knows he he would be you know i think i think cruz uh and, and these guys I think they're going to face a, a barrage when they start running again, and people are going to use the riots in, in the pictures against them <clears throat> in the primaries, and it's well earned. Uh, uh, so, I, I think Pence is doing everything he can to retain his position, and I think he hopes that uh, Trump will further discredit himself uh, once he's out. And, and of course, now that he has no platform. You know, maybe Parler comes back, but that's not going to be 85 million people or 84 million people like he's got now on Twitter. And, and oh, by the way, Twitter is everybody, you know, uh, Twitter, Twitter, <coughs> the left and the right follow him and the media follows him. But now they won't be able to do it, will they? Yeah. So, well, I mean, but, I, I'm just sitting here thinking as you're talking like, you know, when you're when you're criticizing when someone is criticizing Trump 
there was always a yeah, but he hasn't done X, Y, and Z. He's you know he's Trump is good at not laying his cards on the table. Mm -hmm. I feel like the cards have been laid on the table now. It's obvious who he is and what he is, and you're either against that or you're for it. And what do you do with these Republicans who? have known better than anybody else what was going nobody knows better than mike pence nobody knows better than than some of these senators who, lindsey graham for instance who yeah. have known have enabled have been sycophantic and then now have had the change of heart after the cards were laid on the table what what you know well i think people Ted Cruz like, and a holly well, line or how do you deal with it well i think there's a difference between holly and uh, Cruz and graham and uh, these others. Now, you, there was Mick Mulvaney was on the tube this morning, you know, one of the Sunday shows, and and um, and he was asked, "Well, is you said this isn't the Trump you know? Well, how how do you know? And there, what's different? And you know, he mumbo jumboed and and uh, and uh, but he made the case basically that when he was there, uh, Trump." For two years had a lot of people of contradictory points of view which i happen to know is true on some things you know my favorite law the jones act he had people on both sides of that uh least favorite law but um but so he was saying those people are gone and they're all whispering in his ear and they're trying to make him happy and um so you know so holly and cruz are supposed to be big boys you know and what i'm f find interesting and fascinating is if they have totally taken the focus off of the 120 some republicans in the house side who voted uh to overturn the election uh and um maybe because in the house there's so many of them and they're all they're they've lost sight of what's moral and rational i you know the reality is people like our local congressman in my my opinion who was one of the six you know virginia congressmen who voted all together to to blow the election off. Um, I, I, I'm convinced, you know, he's a good guy. He's done some great things. Um, he straddled, you know, right and, and center well. He's got a lot of federal workers, but he put his conscience and his morals in his right hip pocket. So so he, as a defense, and uh, he knew he knew they would lose. Um, he knew there was nothing there, and yet he gave voice to to this you know, the, the, the conspiracy theorists. So in my opinion, he's got blood on his hands too, just like the rest. And That's been the fascinating to watch the Indiana delegation because some of the surprising people that didn't participate, like a, a, the new, the new Congresswoman Sparts, um, you know, uh, Bouchon didn't, Trey Hollingsworth, who've been fairly pro-Trump, you know, and, and Todd mm -hmm. Young, for instance, uh, didn't participate and go along with it. But then there's Mike Braun, who's just malleable, yeah. just a, a lunkhead and then there's jim banks who is a rising star one of the people that when he was in the state senate i got along with very well really have always respected jim banks thought he was just a really decent and upstanding man um and then he has just gone full trump this year as a calculation to you know i i think part of it is these people have so much trouble raising money in the trump era now that they felt that if they did this, it would help with their fundraising, which is their real full-time job. Uh, and, you know, Banks is now just, like, his reputation here is ruined, He's <laughs> except with a certain segment, and maybe that'll prob probably will still get him elected in his district. You know, Greg Pence only went along with Pennsylvania, Mike Pence's brother, and didn't go along with any of the others. Mm. Walorski went along with it, Jim Baird. Um, but Banks has led that delegation, and I mean, to me, it's an unpardonable sin because it's just so nakedly like I. You just watch Banks, and you just go, "You only did this for fundraising." Like, there's well, that's no right, and, and I think, I, to be perfectly honest, I think for most of these people, it will not hurt them because right. they're they're trying to defend against the right flank. And uh, as you know, all of these districts have become much more conservative and concentrated, and uh, only a handful of districts ever change. Uh, and so I, I personally think it's not going to hurt any of them. I wish it would. Uh, I, I do think it may hurt Holly, Holly's um, ambitions and Cruz. And uh, Cruz is so far out of fighting shape. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, 
He's put on weight. He's got this scraggly beard. It looks terrible. Holly, that photo of him on the steps with the fist, yeah. that is going to be, that will be used against him forever. Um, There's a popular libertarian podcaster, radio host named Austin Peterson, who ran against Holly in the hmm. primary and lost. And there isn't like a week that goes by that I don't wish that AP had won. Yeah, of course. <laughs> he would have been a very yeah. pro, he would have been pro Trump, but he would have not have been this, I don't think. Yeah. Just, but you know, so, so, so what is the permanent damage? I mean, we can talk about, speculate about the political damage and all that kind of stuff. And I, I think it's going to be uh, random and erratic as to how the damage falls. Um, but you know, this is about the swamp. So what, what's the swamp doing in all this? Well, Pence is out of the swamp. So Pence followed his constitutional role. He did his job. Um, and, you know, he sat on Trump's lap for four years, but, you know, he's going to have to crawl back in the swamp with everybody else. You know, the, the, the bleachers and the, the inaugural platform on the west uh, front of the Capitol were climbed and, and uh, damaged and all that. You know, the crews are already out there, the swamp, fixing it up because people want, and, and we can call it typically the swamp in a derogatory way, but in reality, we're talking about um, what goes on to, to make life uh, go ahead and the inauguration is going to come off. Um, the cops will be beefed up. Um, the, everybody, I think, will have learned their lesson. Um, the FBI is monitoring uh, the media because they may have cut Trump off, but they can't cut off millions and millions of these people. And as you say, they have other means of communicating. If they're the leadership, I don't believe, you know, most of the people who were on the Hill were leaders. I think most of them are followers. And only takes a handful of leaders with the wrong point of view to lead you into the, you know, you know to the sinkhole. But um, but um, the government is still functioning. Checks are going out. Um, yes, they made a mistake and sent them to the tax preparers. But somebody in the swamp caught that already. Um, you know, so you know these are as I have you know we've talked about repeatedly. There are times when I'm glad the swamp is there and just does its job, and then there are days when I gnash my teeth and and uh and would like to drain the swamp and and yeah i mean when you say these congressmen aren't going to face uh consequences i'm kind of like well then don't the protesters have a point then don't the insurrection they sort of do they do <laughs> they sort of do you know you it's it's this notion of breaking things and trying to fix them and you know i think history will say that on some things trump was right and right to try to break things uh, but where he will be judged a failure is on when you break the China, what are you going to set the table with? And he, he has a complete dearth of ideas uh, that could be executed. And that's going to be the way they write it. And they'll write it as the guy who caused an insurrection at the Capitol. I could. Oh, I know. If he, if he had not done this, if he had not gone down this route, he would have been the guy who got the vaccine out. Yeah, well, you know, that I'm would not be, sure like, he will get credit for that. I, I think what, there are a lot of mistakes the Democrats make. I, I, we may have talked about this last time. I think they should just give him credit. You know, they, they were wringing their hands six and nine months ago saying there would be never, what, you'd get, you'd get a, a vaccine before the end of the year? Well, that's insane. And only if you cut corners and do things you know, poorly and expose the population to death and disease and blah, 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 blah. And here they did it. And the only reason they got it done was because Trump insisted. And that's where a president can make a difference. Yeah. You know, not pretty to watch with him, but you can. This is now his legacy. I mean, the yeah. Wednesday. And and I will say, if there's a, a doubt, anyone listening to my voice is thinking of plotting an insurrection at the inauguration. But the, the danger of this cannot be understated for liberty because, A, these people are not for liberty. I mean, I'm, I don't think yeah. anyone's under the illusion that these people are trying yeah. to overthrow the government for libertarian purposes and, and peaceful anarchism at this point. And what what could end up happening is, you know, everybody over the summer in the libertarian world was going, well, the gun debate's over. Well, that'll be back on the table if, if more violence occurs. Encryption yeah. being broken permanently. The FBI has been trying to break right. encryption for a decade now. That'll get, that'll be on the table. Like, all, uh, the domestic spying program, which was on the ropes, will will be revisited. You'll get a Patriot Act. Oh, absolutely. Like, violence, the 
the consequences of violence are always counter to what the person committing violence wants. It cannot be understated. Well, unless their their point is more violence, and, and <laughs> unless they just have they love it. Uh, one yeah. of the funny things that Rob in that interview, the the two guys that went there yesterday, one of them goes, "Yeah, there were all these guys in tactical gear, like screaming out orders to other people, and everybody was just looking at them like they were super weird and weren't following them." And I just, <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of live action role play, but with wow. live rounds like that's what totally. it sounded like totally well so so i'm gonna show you a t-shirt which okay. you might enjoy uh, sorry i was on mute <laughs> <laughs> which i think uh, my wife gave me but which is the story of last year yes <laughs> I, I you know I, I was sitting here thinking if of course the year has begun on a, this note but it's really the culmination of last year and i i guess in my mind 2020 isn't over until january 20th 2021, frankly, because the big story is politics, the election, uh, and and Zoom, and yeah. uh, go, going you know like this, and we um, and it is uh, um, now bureaucrats in a lot of states have screwed up the vaccine distribution. Here in Virginia, we're like 34th down the list of 50 states. Uh, you know, and we got a, a doctor for a governor. And um, we have this just, I think we have, I think there's a double whammy going on. First of all, it turns out CDC doesn't want to release uh, all the vaccine because they want to make sure they're enough for the double dose. And so you got the vaccine distribution in ha half. And then the states, at least here in Virginia, they don't want to, they're, they're holding back half too, so that um, they can make sure they have the double a dose when if they were thinking about it as a matter of logistics, they would just keep shooting everybody up and expect that the second dose is going to arrive about the time the first dose is out of pocket. So they've they've taken three quarters of the vaccine off the table by double counting. And, and I know uh, I know there are other states just like this one. Yeah, if Indiana, I think, was in, in a similar boat. Uh, so why are they why are they holding it back? Is it just what's the the wisdom of that i mean just well i think they're 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 not thinking through the logistics nor is there sufficient communication it sounds to me between the federal government and the state governments if um, i i did not learn uh, or had not read until i think yesterday that the cdc and the others were holding back about half of the doses so that they could have enough to follow on the first round with the second shot and and biden's whole plan you know biden says we're going to push it all out and you'll get a second shot in time, we'll get it to you. And I, I think that's the intelligent way to approach this. Um, so will it work uh, without the booster? I thought well, there, like the data is it's interesting. It depends on the vaccine, but there is data that shows, I think it's the AstraZeneca one. Um, actually, the results are better with one dose than with two doses. So hmm. um, I think we're still learning on all this stuff. We're learning as to, you know, it appears that the, the, the uh, alternate strains are, are and probably subject to this one too and all that but uh, but I, I do think it sounds to me like they really screwed up the logistics um, I don't think it's the general so much I think it's probably CDC and a policy decision so mm. and of course I'm hoping to get my shot but I'm not old enough which is ironic <laughs> <laughs> darn it <laughs> darn <laughs> well I'm not old or sick enough yeah well, let's hire <laughs> at the age of 70 <laughs> hire a makeup person and no <laughs> just like yeah, right <laughs> yeah yeah well uh, you know i could probably cross down to florida unfortunately i don't don't own a condo down there anymore but could have gone down there they're shooting up anybody who arrives so really <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so i haven't read it, that yeah so anyway. i want to i want to go back i mean looking ahead um there are two minds on what happens next that this is the the final gasp of Trumpism, and that this was the peak of the violence, and they're gonna he'll fade into irrelevancy and obscurity, and then there are, the other mind is that this is just the beginning, that Trumpism is not going away; it's going to completely change the Republican Party, and uh, that that there will be more violence, and that he's not going away; he'll become more powerful. I mean, when you look ahead, what do you see for Republicans and for the Trumpist movement? Well, so I think that it's a great question and everybody's trying to figure that out. And, it, and part of it goes right back to this week, what the Congress does. Um, I know that 
we, everybody's talking about Trump's point of view, which is, is uh, should he resign so he can avoid uh, prosecution by Pence, you know, waving the magic, magic pardon. But on, the, on his, frankly, his Republican uh, opponents, Cruz and, and Hawley and these other guys, anybody who wants to run should be voting for impeachment mm. uh, because that's the only way they can keep him from running. Yeah. Uh, for, for certainty. It may be that all of this, the events of this week end up keeping him from running, but I, I, I wouldn't bet on that. Uh, and I wouldn't bet on his fading away. Um, and then the Democrats, I, I think as much as I would love to see uh, Trump taken off the table, maybe through impeachment or, or through the 25th amendment, Pence getting a little spine and, and, uh, and, uh, calling the remainder of the cabinet together and get half of them declare him uh, unfit. Uh, I don't expect that to happen. And, you know, I saw Colin, Colin Powell on TV the day before ya, yesterday, and I saw um, uh, Ben Sass on yesterday. And, and I th they asked Powell, um, should, shouldn't we be impeaching? Isn't that the important thing to do? And he said, you know, he's going to be gone. Uh, Joe Biden needs space. He needs a clean slate. And if you make um, Trump the message, it's just going to screw up the beginning of his presidency. We need to look forward, not backwards, which I thought was so he, he said he deserved it, but don't do it. And then Ben Sass, the reporter, says, don't you think that's the single most important thing, Donald Trump? And he said, no, no, it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that there's a new administration and, and um, we need to move forward and, and end the past. And I think that's probably good advice. Um, so I think the odds are he'll be impeached. The Senate will not, uh, well, they may start it actually uh, because um, uh, Schumer will become majority leader on the 20th at, uh, well, before that, actually. Well, no, the 20th, because they need Kamala Harris to, to vote to, for the Democrats. Um, and he could pick up the cudgel at that point. But I just can't imagine, and particularly listening to Biden, that he wants that to happen. So my, my best bet is that Trump um, gets off scot-free, except for all the noise, goes back to Mar-a-Lago, uh, where the residents who surround him are going to sue him for living there. Um, and then he won't have the Twitter platform and the other means, but uh, he will have people who are willing to write him checks and everything else so he can buy or build a network and he'll do that. His kids are still running around. Uh, Don Jr. <coughs> I, think, so, I think Jared and Ivanka will just disappear. Eric and, I, and yeah, Don will. Yeah, but I think the party, I think the parties, I think people have short memories in politics, uh, particularly voters. I, I know uh, occasionally they don't, but generally they have pretty short memories. And I suspect the party is now largely the Trump party without all the histrionics. I think, um, unfortunately, we the, we, the party have become anti-immigration and uh, anti-everything. Uh, and pro border wall and, and sort of no policy positions that are based on anything rational. And uh, so in my mind, the Republican party has become the rhinos, you know, Republican yeah. in name only. I'm one of those people who thinks Republicans respect institutions and, and conservatives. Well, they, the, it baked it's, into the heart of conservatism is the rule of law. Yeah. And that's yeah. that's the key here is the rule of law and respecting the law and its existence. And that's the hard part about Trump is, let's say you pass in, an impeachment bill that includes that he can't be president again. His him and his followers don't care what that says. He, yeah. <laughs> you know, he doesn't care about being a legal or illegal president. He's president, right. and right. we're going to impose our will on you through violence and. You know, that's where this becomes dangerous is that you've got two constitutions out there running. That's when it becomes, I mean, there's yeah. there's the hopeful view that you've just outlined is sort of like the 1918 pandemic where everybody acted so awful that once it was kind of over, everybody just said, I want to forget this period of my life. I don't want you to remind me about it. We're not even going to make art or music or films about any of this. Like two books were written about it at the time. Like 
you know, that maybe people, once this is kind of over on the 20th, just go, I just don't ever want to think about him again, you know? But I, I think they're going to be, I, I just think, you remember, they made the election about the rule of law. Right. That, well, they're not following their own laws. Well, that's not true. Well, they did something here and there unlawfully. Well, that's not true. So it's back and forth, charges of lawful, unlawful. And, um, you know, the good things that could come out of the election, aside from Trump disappearing, um, would be, I, I think it's probably worth doing an electoral commission to once and for all uh, look at the ballots and how the states do it and and the, the Constitution leaves it up to the states to do these things, but it doesn't mean um, there can't be a meeting of the minds about sort of what's best practice. Uh, and the important fact, most of them do follow best practice fairly carefully on, on the votes, and you know, which includes having printed ballots even on the, elect the, uh, the machines and not being online um, to the web, so you can't be hacked and things like that. So, but I think. I think that would be important. And, and frankly, they need to put somebody who's from the Trump side on that commission. Um, so they're covering on that too. So I think that would be a good thing. I don't think it would be good for them to pursue him. Um, uh, you know, Merrick Garland, thank God, they appointed Merrick. Merrick is a, you know, he, as you know, he's a friend and known him probably 40 years. And Really? And, yeah. And I, I was- I don't think we've talked about that. I didn't know well, that. Well, I was outraged at what Mitch McConnell did on on Merrick and uh, you know I was asked to write a check ten thousand dollar check to McConnell a couple of years ago by Elaine <laughs> who I've known also for a long time and I just I, I just could not stomach the idea and I what I said at the time was uh, you know I don't I'd made a decision a long time ago only to give to Virginia politicians because that's where I live plenty of people giving at the national level. And number two, only to people who needed my money. And, and so, oh, great. Well, thanks, Bob. Click. <laughs> that was, you know, that kind of conversation. I could not give him a penny. And, and frankly, I'm probably not ever again going to vote for this Republican congressman here because of what he did today. But I think my case is unusual. Uh, I think most people will forget and uh, rationalize and, um, and I think a lot of these guys will pick up that Trump cudgel and just make life difficult. This is where the people in the middle, though, in the Senate, can be really important. You know, um, Lisa Murkowski and and Manchin and uh, uh, Susan Collins and people like that. This is where they can really show their stripes. Romney, people like that, can make the difference. They can move things from one side to the other side. Um, and I think Schumer could show some comedy to, that's not comedy with a D. Right, he'll do both. <laughs> yeah, to, uh, to the Republicans. Uh, you know, the last time there was a sort of semi-power sharing arrangement, they, uh, uh, they got roughly equal numbers of, of senators on each committee. Um, I think Pelosi uh, is probably okay. Uh, there are a few congressmen that would go on the Republican side with her. Um, the problem is the Senate, where you need 60, and I suspect if Schumer, um, you know, Schumer doesn't uh, do some deal, then Mitchell will, will uh, be a, a thorn in his side. But, but, but back to all this, people like oh, Merrick Garland, I really doubt that he will see any sense in, in pursuing Trump like a wounded rabbit through the woods, you know, I, I, and I think they will be better off if they don't let him slink away and uh, and just go on with life and and show some successes what about the state's attorneys generals like the you know uh, I, I would have the same point of view about it. i would not vote for one of them again either i just i think all of these people have exhibited um, a tremendous tremendous lack of moral, moral courage and intelligence there are some who believe what they say but by and large, I don't believe most do. My question is more, do you think um, Trump, so final Trump question, because I want to ask you about Garland, but you know, do you think that the attorney generals in New York or some of these places will pursue him legally? 
And do you think that he will pardon himself? My gut says he's absolutely going to pardon himself and he'll pardon anybody who was involved in the Capitol insurrection. He's going to, he's going to, if you know, stone and Manafort, those weren't controversial. He's going, he'll do Assange, he'll do Snowden, he'll do himself. He's going to leave with as much chaos as humanly possible. Um, but do you think he pardons himself? And then do you think that he faces charges in the States? I think it's possible that he will pardon himself. Uh, possible, but frankly, not likely. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a Hail Mary. Uh, <laughs> number two on the states. I think the states, I would have the same point of view on the states. They would be better off to let him go and slink away because wherever they pursue him, he will be the news, not Biden, not the new page, not the new year, not the future. It will be about Trump and the past and not anything that comes out will change anyone's minds. Um, it will all be a witch, seen as a witch hunt. And frankly, it is a witch hunt. Um, you know, prosecutors have, a, so, um, you know, the New York prosecutor uh, is, you know, I think he's somewhat of a, an idiot. He's not quite as smart as his dad was. Um, if he's smart, he'll just drop it. They just, or, or do a settlement, offer Trump a settlement. So he admits guilt or, or whatever you know they they need to make trump go away mm. it, and he will not go away if he's in the news every day about um a trial and being beaten up by these people that his supporters think are the bad guys now yeah the sooner you kill the victim menta mentality the victimhood the sooner that yeah. fever kind of breaks i would imagine yeah, I just think he's they got to let him go home. He's going to spend a lot of time stewing and figuring out how to make himself rich again. You know, he he uh, I'd be willing to bet his net worth is down by 50 percent, whatever it happened to have been. It's half of what it was. Um, and he needs to deal with that. But what about the argument that if you don't punish him for his crimes, if, if we continue to keep letting politicians off of the hook and they don't face consequences, then in the future, <clears throat> people will do this same thing in the future, but they'll be more effective at it. I think, unless it's a clear-cut crime, um, it, it's really hard for people to accept that uh, political punishment in politics. You know, the Romans uh, had a rule, basically, for most of the empire that they did not um, execute uh, their predecessors for crimes or anything like that. Uh, because they knew that was a way to, uh, that was revenge, or it would be seen as revenge, where well, maybe it wasn't revenge. Uh, there is no question Trump incited th that mob, that, that uh, insurrectionist mob. Um, I truly doubt he believed they would go uh, break through the Congress and essentially carry the torches. But um, Irrespective of that, he, he, it's like crying fire in a crowded theater. You can be arrested and jailed for that. So, um, so he deserves impeachment. He should resign, maybe. But in point of fact, it just does no good whatsoever other than to make the people who prosecute him feel good. 40% of the country will feel that it's a political vendetta, including people like me. I think they should just let him quietly go, just like Colin Powell said and, and Ben Sass. Let him leave mm. out the door. Close the door behind him. Um, don't let him back in. Um, remind people of what a bad actor he was. He's He will remind people of what a bad actor he was. So, so tell us more about Merrick Garland. Who is he as a person? I mean, what is he like? How did you know each other? You know, what can we expect? I mean, he's got a big task in resetting the justice department after two yeah two two, two administrations that really just kind of used well, it in a way that you know yeah well bar i must say I, the bar is going to have i think i think he sort of you know at the end tried to clean up his act a little bit and i and he of course has said he should be impeached and this and that and, but i i think Barr's big problem is that he had a fairly good reputation in circles in dc and i there will be people still who will forgive and forget all that and say, well, he was just doing what he could, you know, to to keep the republic on a, the boat on an even keel while the president the president was manning the helm and um, it was patriotic duty to save us. But 
the reality is I think he'll have a harder time. I'm, you, we're not, per, you know, I don't, I, I see Merrick about once every 10 years, probably. Um, he, he used to date a woman who worked with my wife at McKinsey. And then um, he and she broke up, remained friends. Uh, we would see them, you know, every so often, every other year or two or three and dinner and um, exchange emails. And he, he married a wonderful woman and uh, the woman who he dated married a wonderful guy and everybody's living happily ever after. And, and, and uh, he, is, he is personally as about as centrist a person and stable a person as you can imagine. You know, he, he, he uh, teaches, uh, he tutors, has done it. He did his kids' soccer teams. He's, uh, he is genuinely a, a super smart and super nice guy. He's got great experience. You know, he was on the Oklahoma bombing. Um, he was the lead on that. Um, he was a guy who got Timothy McVeigh, basically. Um, he's got good civil rights background. He's got good terrorism background. Um, he's been a, a very moderate jurist. This is why it's a shame he didn't make it to the Supreme Court. And this is why, you know, people like that naked abuse of power that Mitchell did against him when he uh, uh, was nominated by Obama 10 and a half months before the election. Um, uh, so anyway, he, I think he'll be terrific. Do you think that Garland, bomb thrower. right. Do you think Garland was chosen over Doug Jones, the former Alabama Senator um, because of the domestic terrorist background that maybe they feel that there's going to be, I mean, there's a, pretty growing threat according to everybody in cybersecurity that you know domestic terrorism is going to go on the rise once we have Biden as do you think he was chosen for that background then um, I would I'm guessing that that was important but <clears throat> I think the bigger issue is when you look at Biden's cabinet choices all together by and large they are people who he's known for a long time who are uh, who are well established and uh, they're, none of them are bomb throwers. You know, you think about the education portfolio, Randy Weingarten, and uh, was, who's the head of the NEA, uh, the teachers union. Everybody on the, on the union side wanted her, but of course nobody on anywhere else wanted her, but she's, she's the equivalent of a bomb thrower in, that, in education. The bomb thrower because she wants a status quo, not to change things. She's against charter schools and this and that. And um, and he chose a guy who ran the Philadelphia schools, who, who uh, was on neither one side or the other. He, he, he implemented some of the reform things, and he supported traditional union teachers as well, and this and that. So, uh, so I think Merrick fits nicely into the category of people that Biden has picked for his cabinet. When you look at that cabinet, they're all pretty gray with a few exceptions. They're all um, largely wise, smart people, intelligent people. Um, they are very centered for the most part. Um, and uh, they're very, uh, they're just no bomb throwers in that group anywhere. And I think Doug Jones, I'm sure Biden had met him a couple times, but uh, I know he knew Merrick. Because mm. he, you know, there and there the videos of him at the White House and this and that in the ceremony. And when he, when he got picked, were you like you see it on Twitter and you're like, holy cow? <laughs> what, I was like, be a weird feeling. Yes. <laughs> and I, I and uh, and sent a note to my wife and uh, who was doing something else and my daughter in in uh, Dallas and my son in in uh, Australia and they said, oh yes, you know, you, you know, I know you and mom know him and that kind of thing. So. Yes, it was just a, a yes with a fist and an exclamation point and kind of like revenge in some ways, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was the right. I mean, it was a very politically smart move from Obama to pick him because he was so yeah. unassuming and hard to be mad at and there's nothing to pick on. And he seemed like a, a decent guy and he was centrist and like a probably Obama. I always felt was just sitting in his office going, all right, let them, let them wail and complain about this guy. Good luck. Yeah. And you know, they and sure they, did. They, they did. Absolutely. So anyway, so we're glad. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we always end with a little dining guide to DC and, you know, people one day 
hopefully this year we'll be able to make it to DC. I'm, uh, everybody's shown up to DC. Let's say when you're in there at January 20th for one rally or another, <laughs> where should people go eat? Uh, I'm not sure anything is going to be open. I think that, uh, you know, the DC rules have been back and forth and back and forth. They had a 6 PM curfew the other day. And, um, uh, so I don't know if you can even do indoor dining, you know, actually, if I were there, I, I would miss a lot of restaurants. I, I saw a thing the other day that about restaurants that have permanently shut down, uh, you know, there's one called Penn Social that some Pennsylvania, one of the big best known restaurants for years is the Oval Room, uh, right near the White House and across the street from uh, Bombay Club. And I know Bombay Club is still open. And if you're down that area, that's, that is about, it's a fabulous uh, Indian and probably um, it's not the kind of Indian you're necessarily used to. Uh, we tend to be uh, used to more hot curry type. This is more the Raj, um, but it's by the same guy. Uh, uh, Ashok Bajaj, who has an empire. Philip Seafood's gone. Uh, mm. You know, that was there for a million years. Uh, Ann Cashin was, uh, is one of the best known women chefs in DC and she re- opened a restaurant, Johnny's Half Shell, and that's closed. Um, one of the, the um, uh, other, by another woman, Chef Boundary Stone is closed. That was made famous by the Obamas. They used to love that one. Um, the best taqueria place in DC, El, El Centro closed uh, uh, you know it's just uh so right now i'm i'm bemoaning the loss of a lot of the restaurants but yeah. um if you're down near uh, again i would say it's gonna be hard to get anywhere near capitol hill if you're anywhere in dc though i go to the waterfront um, there are a bunch of great restaurants down on the waterfront of all price points uh, and i would say not only the the, the area where i currently have a place uh, in the Navy Yard, but also over at the area called the Wharf, which was redeveloped and lots of touristy type stuff. But there's some terrific restaurants. And it's, you can't go wrong in either of the, these two areas, to be honest. Is there anything like around Capitol Hill that's in walking distance that you just really enjoy? Hmm. There are. Well, let's say I'm going to see, you know, the Smithsonian or Capitol Hill or the the Ford's Theater, like, that kind of area. You planning to go? Uh, I at some point I will. I mean, but <laughs> well, tell I me. Just, we'll I'm just there. thinking. I think if people, you know, when people go to DC, they're kind of like right around that area, the White House, yeah. the, the yeah. mall. You know, they want to walk and get a sandwich. I remember eating at some place, and there was like all these senators in 2003. I was like, oh, I'm. Well, you were you were probably, probably at uh, uh, the. Uh, oh golly, what's the name of it? It's been there like a hundred years. Um, I'm like sandwich town. Place. It's old. Te- no, uh, well, see, I don't typically go to sandwich place. I'm right. sorry, because right. <laughs> I'm usually going out for dinner. Right. <laughs> I make my own sandwiches, yeah. <laughs> but but the uh, uh, a lot of what you see around the hill is um, not high end, uh, and the reason is that it's it has to be close enough for Santa Hill staffers to be able to walk there and grab a sandwich. A lot of them are bars, um, uh, you know, Hawk and Dove and all those things were they're, they're still there probably. Um, uh, so there are a lot of bars. There are a handful of very good ones on Pennsylvania Avenue up near the Capitol. Uh, one uh, Spanish restaurant, I'm having a hard time. I can see it. It was very good. Um, but generally, you're not going to find the fine dining within three or four blocks of Capitol Hill. And mm. you could argue that's because a lot of these people are you know, the, the heart of America. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want anything right. fancy. Right. They, we, they, want, we want McDonald's. We want, yeah. Yeah. Well, they're not even made of those. <laughs> that, that might be too upscale for parts of the hill. <laughs> <laughs> That's all these guys living. I mean, you the, the swamp documentary on HBO, like Matt Gates just living in his, in the Capitol building. Like that was a big thing when Todd Rakita sure. was a yeah. guy that he, He's an attorney general of Indiana, state attorney general now, and participated in all the nonsense. But he and I, it's the first campaign I worked on. We'd known each other for a long time. And he got like, it was 2010, maybe 2012, when all those guys started living in their, uh, like, now they have like a whole system and they've kind of relaxed the rules against that. So, yeah, you know, running over and yep. getting quick pizza. All right, Robin. Well, but there are a lot of new restaurants, by the way. Next time we talk, I'll give you a list. 
Uh, yeah, all right. Well, I feel like we've covered a lot. <laughs> There's yeah, <laughs> uh, as so much. I'm glad we got it all in on time. And thank you so much for, uh, totally. for talking. That's been great. Happy New Year. All right. Thank you so much for listening today. I want to thank my co-host, Rob Cortell, for joining me. If you enjoyed the conversation, then please share it with a friend and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We will see you again next week.